Genesis 25, as uh, Sebastian read. Let's go ahead and take a little deeper look into these verses, which I hope will be a tremendous encouragement for you. For, before we look at this passage, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to the, the flood, the Noadic flood, uh, when the ark finally came to a rest. Eight people emerged from the ark. From those eight people came one race, the human race. Despite the claims of scientists and others, there's only one race. There's a human race. The Bible also traces Adam and Eve's genealogy, I mean, Noah's family's genealogy all the way back to Adam and Eve, the first two parents. So you and I, no matter what we look like, we are one race. Now within that race, certainly there are some variances. There's nations, there's languages, uh, there's skin color, and there are also some physical differences. Um, I can think of one just off the top of my head yesterday. Um, my nephew is here. He came back from uh, Korea. He's playing professional basketball in Korea, and he's uh, trying to get a leg heal, and his brother is a therapist, so they're going to be working together until the end of the year. And I got to hug my nephew like this. <laughs> he's going to be here and he probably, he's probably this tall. I, I, I never felt so small in my life. He's a big kid. Uh, not all of us have been blessed like that, have we, Pastor? You have been blessed in other ways. Uh, but there are so many variances, aren't there, amid this human race. This morning, I want to talk about two of those. Within the variance, there's actually only two families You'll notice here in this passage, two families are described. One on Ishmael's side and the other's Isaac's side. The two sons of Abraham. They demonstrate to us or characterize for us the, the fact that within the human race, even amidst all the variances, there are only two families. The families are 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 17, or 16, verse 7. It tells us that God, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the what? The heart. Now, one family, their hearts have been changed. The other family, their hearts need to be changed. That's all the world is made up of. Two families, those whose hearts are changed and those whose hearts need to be changed. Now there's needs to be an understanding this morning of what family you're a part of. I want you to grab that. I want you to hang on to it. And you already have a great idea what family you belong to. And I'm so thankful for your confidence and your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want us to first look at those who are, if man looks at the outside, there's this physical reality of being part of a family. I want you to notice, number one, your outline, those who are blessed in the physical realm. Even if the, your heart hasn't been changed by God and you haven't come to the place of surrendering to him and living for him, recognize that you're still blessed. You're still blessed. There's, a, there's definitely a physical blessing. Abraham's family was blessed, weren't they? Number one, Abraham's descendants. There are those who are physically or close and physically closely associated with the righteousness and the goodness of God. In other words, you can be physically right where you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to be. There are those who are that, that have that physical connection. Abraham's descendants were such. In chapter 25, verses 12 through 18, we can see that Ishmael was a descendant of Abraham. In chapter 25, verses 1 through 6, Abraham had other sons who were also descendants of Abraham, obviously. In chapter 17, verse 20, back up, 17, verse 20. Notice what God said about those 
who were physical descendants of Abraham. As for Ishmael, especially in the case of Ishmael, I have heard you. I will certainly what? Bless him. As your descendant, I will bless him. I will make him fruitful and will multiply him greatly. And he will fa father 12 tribal leaders and I will make him into a great nation. That's a blessing that God promised for the physical descendants of Abraham. God did that. And now, what's interesting is when you go over to the Gospel of John, verse 30, or chapter 8, verse 30, the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 30. The Jews knew of this privilege that was theirs as physical descendants of Abraham. And they were in dialogue with Jesus concerning that fact. They had understood that this Jesus was making these claims that he was the son of God. And he was constantly in conflict with the Pharisees and the scribes, all of the religious leaders. And uh, he was talking about being the son of God. And they were saying, we're, we're God's children. We're the offspring of Abraham. And Jesus goes on in that passage to say this, if you were in verse 39, Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did. If you claim to be his kids, you would do what his kids did. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this, and you're going to do what your father does. A little further down in verse 44, Jesus said in verse 43, because you cannot listen to my word, you are of your father, the devil. They had physical claims to be descendants of Abraham. In reality, Jesus was opening their eyes to see that they weren't really children of Abraham or God's chosen just because they were physical descendants. They were actually in control and a part of the family of Satan. He was their father demonstrated by their actions. What they did proved who they belonged to. So here this claim is, although you can be blessed physically, spiritually you could be missing the reality of what it means to be part of the family of God. Now the second thing is, there's part of the physical blessing is the fact that you sometimes are blessed with material prosperity, correct? Uh, God blesses his children, doesn't he, with physical things? I've been blessed. You've been blessed, did you eat this morning? If you chose not to, I mean, you didn't, but you have a roof over your head, perhaps a vehicle to get here, God's blessed us. So many ways, material things. In Genesis, or Matthew chapter five, verse 45, here Jesus says that God causes the sun to, to shine on the, the good and the evil, and the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous, doesn't matter who you are, God blesses with physical things. Now that's a struggle for those who are righteous. Job had that struggle. You can read that in Job chapter 12, verses seven through 13. He was wondering why the wicked seem to prosper. Why do they always have it good? Why do they go to bed at night and they lay down in comfort and, and their houses are secure? Why does this happen, Lord? and they don't even acknowledge anything about you. You've had those questions before, haven't you? If you've been honest with yourself, you've, you've asked that, Lord, why are people who don't even know you prospering and I'm struggling today? And Jeremiah had the same struggle. And then over in Psalm 94, the psalmist in verse three, how long will you allow these wicked ones to gloat? Chapter 37 is a whole chapter. Psalm 37 is a whole chapter uh, on the fact that the righteous struggle with those who prosper. And in Matthew chapter 19, the disciples certainly had a struggle with this same fact. Matthew chapter 19, verse 23. Then Jesus says to his, to his disciples, I assure you, it will be hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now they hear this and immediately, what is their response? 
Again, it is, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were utterly astonished. They couldn't believe it. In their minds, they're thinking, wait a minute, they have prospered by the hand of God. God has been so gracious to get them to give them so much. If God's blessed them in this way, isn't, isn't this for whom the kingdom of God is for? And so they were puzzled. You see, people today believe because they've been blessed in the physical realm that they're all right with God. But obviously that's not the case. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Even rich people can go to heaven. You see how God blesses in the physical realm? I think number three is another characterization of God's blessing that we need to be concerned about being part of or associated with a church family. Uh, I hear people say, and you've probably heard too, you know, when you speak about spiritual matters, well, I've been baptized, I belong to such and such a church. These sort of things don't make you a Christian. Those are what Christians do. Certainly they follow through in obedience and baptism. Certainly they want to be a part of a church family. Uh, that's, that's part of our existence. But that doesn't make us right with God. The Hebrews writer, I think, clearly said it. They've, you can even taste of the heavenly things, partake of the spiritual matters, and just miss the boat completely. Listen to how Peter says it, or Timothy, Paul says it to Timothy, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Beginning with verse 1. But know this. Now he's talking to Timothy, who's a pastor who's going to talk to the church. So he's given instruction for a leader to guide the people of God. Know this, difficult times will come in the last days. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now you think that sounds like the world. Well, that's not who he's talking to. He's talking to those who have made an association with the family of God, the church. Within the church, these are sort of people that can exist. Do you believe that? Notice what he goes on and says. Verse five, the holding to the form of religion. You know what a form is? It's something that is on the outside that holds what is on the inside together. And so he said it has a form of religion, but denying its power, there's no inward reality. On the outside it looks right, but on the inside, it's wrong. Remember what, G, what God said? God doesn't, man looks at the outside, God looks at the inside. You can have the outside looking correctly, but the inside can be completely wrong. He says, avoid these people, stay away from them. If a person claims to be a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and acts like these characterizations here, then those are the type of people we should avoid. Now, non-Christians, we don't want to avoid them. We want to teach them about Christ, and we want to share the good news of Jesus Christ. But realize, if a person claims to be a follower of Christ and lives like this, our responsibility is to deal with them. And if they're not going to be reconciled, then to avoid them. Now, not only avoid them, but avoid being like them. Uh, we got to look, check our own lives and make sure I'm not living like this. For among them are those who worm their way into households and capture idle women burdened down with sin, led along by a variety of passions, always learning and never able to come to knowledge of the truth. 
wow, I always want to be in Bible studies and more and more, and just nothing seems to take root. Just as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so these also resist the truth, men who are corrupt in mind, worthless in regard to the faith, but they will not, not make further progress, for their lack of understanding will be clear to all, as theirs was also. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father. And then they cried out and said, Lord, but didn't we? Didn't we do this and that? Weren't we associated with your believers, your family? Jesus said, be gone, I never knew you. So, this is the point I think this passage is making in Genesis. You can be part of the physical blessings of God. Be descendants of those who are faithful followers of Christ. You can be descendants of Abraham. You can be blessed with material things so much that you're comfortable and you're able to share with others. You can be a part of a, a family of believers and still not be a part of the family of God. We can't kid ourselves. Paul said, examine yourself to be sure that you're in the faith. That's a thing we constantly need to do. Make sure we are walking with the Lord. Now, let's move on to the good news. Number two, those who are blessed in the spiritual realm. Those who are blessed in the spiritual realm. I think you see that in verses 20 through to 26. When we talk about Isaac, how the Lord moved in Isaac's life and then uh, Isaac has children, and uh, we, we just see constantly God at work, and when you see God at work, what do you see godly people doing? Responding to God. I want you to hang on to that, because that's very important. When God works, it's our responsibility to respond to him. Now, those who are blessed in the spiritual realm, this is something you have no control over. It, it, it does its work in your life. It's the work of God. Well, all you can do is respond to what God is doing in your life. Number one, God's sovereign choice. God's sovereign choice. Look at verse 22. It says, but the children inside her, this was Rebecca's womb, were struggling with each other. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the other will serve the younger. When her time came to give birth, there were indeed twins in her womb. The first one came out reddish, covered with hair, like a fur coat, and, the name, and they named him Esau. And this, after this, his brother came out grasping Esau's heel with his hand. So they were... He was named Jacob. And that tells us Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. Now, if you take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 9, I hope this will, this will become clear to you. Notice how within the womb, what was happening in the womb? There was a battle going on, right? And the two of them were at, were at odds with each other in the womb. Now, some of your moms have experienced that, haven't you? It was just one kid <laughs> had odds with him or herself. All right, Romans chapter 9. I hope this will help you. Verse 1. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying, my conscience testifying to me with the Holy Spirit, that I have intense sorrow and continual anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from the Messiah for the benefit of my brothers, my countrymen, by physical descent. See what he's saying? He's saying, listen, my, my physical descent is not in. They've rejected the Messiah. They're not part of the family of God. I wish I could lose my salvation, he's basically saying, so they could be saved. They are Israelites. 
And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises. Uh, God graciously, this physical choice he made to share with them what they could have as far as eternal life and all the wonderful things of God, God made it possible for Israel to have all of it. What a blessing. The forefathers are theirs, and from them by physical descent came the Messiah, who is God over all, blessed forever, amen. It's not the blessing God wants us to focus on, but it's his Messiah that came. Verse six, but it is not as though the word God has failed. For not all who are descendants from Israel are Israel. Praise the Lord. That makes it possible for you and me as Gentiles to be part of the family of God, descendants of Abraham. Neither are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. On the contrary, in Isaac, your seed will be called. That is, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but the children of the promise are considered seed. For this is the statement of the promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only that, but also Rebekah became pregnant by Isaac, our forefather. For though they had not been born yet or done anything good or bad, they're in the womb, other than fighting probably, so that God purposed according to election might stand not from works but from the one who calls she was told the other will serve the younger as it is written jacob i have loved esau i have hated even in the womb god made a choice through whom he was going to work now i can tell you i don't understand all of how god works in the fact of choosing those who will receive him. But let me tell you, it is God who does the choosing. I think there's, I don't know if you have pet peeves, you do, because I hear some of them sometimes, but I, I, I say silly things sometimes that I wish I didn't say. And then there's times where I hear things said and I wish they didn't say it. And one of them that just gets me is when someone says, I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. And my point is this, you didn't accept him, he accepted you. He chose you. It was God's sovereign choice to choose you to be a part of the family of God. What you did is you received his graciousness towards you and his mercy and his forgiveness. You received that. Does that make, more, does that make sense? Is, is that, am I trying to split hairs here? I always feel like maybe I'm being too concerned about semantics. I just think we got to understand that God accepted us and how humbling that is. And, and why God chooses some and others are rejected, let me tell you why. Because many, all that God wants to come to him, refuse to come. They refuse to accept the gracious gift of his, his, his forgiveness. They refuse to accept the gracious gift of faith. They refuse to accept the gracious gift of repentance. They refuse all of it. And as a result, God does not bring them into the kingdom. It's not that God just simply is out there choosing some people to go to heaven and some to hell, and and let's just sit back and let's watch him do his thing. God is at work, and he's choosing us to come to him. Yet we have a responsibility to respond to him. Number two, God's choice is based on grace alone, which I already alluded to. It's all about his grace. He's chosen you and me by grace. I wasn't looking for God. I I had no desire for God to be in my life. And all these things started working in my life and he was drawing me to himself. Just as the scripture said, he draws us to himself. Chapter two of Genesis tells us that we're all sinners. Like Adam and Eve, we've, we've sinned. We've 
What have we done? We've rejected God's desire for our lives. We refused it rather than responding to him in obedience. That's what Adam and Eve did. They were given it all and they failed to respond. And God graciously in chapter 3 verse 15 told us that he would send the promised seed who would squash the head of Satan. Graciously he provided that. It tells us there in, in uh, Genesis chapter 6 verse 8, that God looked upon Noah. Why? With favor. Why? Why did he look upon Noah? Because God was at work and Noah was responding to him. And this caught God's eye because of Noah grasping the graciousness and the goodness of God. Noah knew there was nothing in him that made him right before God. He just took what God had offered him and he accepted it and believed in it. And God was favorable to him. What about Abraham? Here's a guy who's an idol worshiper in chapter 12, and God chooses him to leave his land and go to a land that he would show him. And what does Abraham do? He doesn't drag his feet, he goes. What amazes me is that God never told him where to go. Remember I told you that? God never told Abraham where to go, he just went. And then God began to guide him. In chapter 17, verse 21, God chose through Isaac's seed that the promised one would come. That was God's choice. He chose it all by his grace. He says, this is my covenant with Isaac. In Romans chapter 19, or chapter 9, verse 13, as Jacob I've loved. I, I've chosen Jacob. That was a gracious thing for him to do that. So it's not by birthright. You don't get born in the kingdom of God because you were born physically. It's not by strength. Verse 23, as they fought with each other in the womb, the stronger one did not prevail. God chose the weaker one. That's how wonderful God is. So it's not by strength, especially in Zechariah chapter 4, where it says it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He does his work, and it's his gracious work. And it's not by merit. In other words, you can't say because someone responds to God's graciousness, that that is some attempt at them working. No, it's just receiving. It's being dumped on you and you're just standing. It's like, it's like the back of my pickup truck when I loaded rocks in it one day. It just sat there and it received all those rocks. And that's what a, a person does. By the grace of God, he's given you the ability to have faith. He's given you the ability to repent. He's given you the ability to simply trust him. It's all by his grace and his mercy. And you're just the receptacle. So you receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. It's all by Him. And Matthew chapter 3 is another passage, and you can read that for yourself about not by merit as the Pharisees and the Sadducees thought. It's, but it's number, and the fourth one, and number two, is that it's by response in faith. In faith. You trust God, and you trust Him alone. And I love John chapter 1, verse 10. Turn there, if you will. John chapter 1, verse 10. Speaking of Jesus, John, said, uh, John tells us that he was in the world, and the world was created through him. Yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. What did he say? They didn't accept him. They did not re receive him. But to all who do receive him. I love this translation. That's why I'm emphasizing it. <laughs> because it says receive, doesn't it? But all who receive him, he gave the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, or the will of flesh, or the will of man, but of God. It's all God. I hope you understand that. Even though you've received the gracious gift of salvation, realize that it's all the result of what God was doing in your life and all that God provided for you to respond to him. That's, that's just 
causes me to stand in awe of his greatness and his marvelous and infinite grace. Now, number three, God's chosen are his family. They're his family. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, it tells us that we're God's household, the church of the living God. We're a family here. And trust me, I miss my family this morning. Not just my wife, but I'm talking about your spouses too that are gone. You know, and, and, I, and, I, and I miss Ed and Gail, and they're gone. You, know, you, just, you just miss your family when you're there. We're family here. And when some of us aren't here, we miss each other. We, we've grown accustomed to like each other, or we've just grown on each other. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18, he gives you a clear understanding of how we are family and, and how, how we're supposed to be as a family, what it looks like. In other words, we're different. And we don't associate with those who aren't different. We don't just allow wickedness to be a part of our family. We want those who have responded by faith to Christ through the work and the power of God in their lives. Every Christian who has come to know the Lord as their, their Savior, they're welcome to be a part of this family. That's what we want. People who know Him. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 46, it tells us that Jesus was speaking. They came to him and said, Jesus, your, your mother and your brothers are out here. And Jesus turned to them and said, pointing to his disciples, these are my mother and my brothers. Those who do the will of my father. Who's your family? Your family, yes. By blood, you have a family. But by spirit, you have a family that's going to last for all eternity. My prayer is both of them come together. That your physical family comes to know Christ. But realize this, God has placed you into his spiritual family. He's blessed you with something you could have not have possibly created without him. A saving relationship and a bond and a unity that will last for all eternity. I, I, I'm... That, you can't get a better deal than that. And all you have to do is receive it. Now, those in God's family, let's rapid fire through these. And I'll get you out of here before noon. All right, 11. Those in God's family. They, their love is expected. You know, if God is love and he's our father, what are we supposed to do? We love because what? He first loved us. Good, that's what John says. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 tells us that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. I think that needs to be our example and our demonstration of, of love toward people who don't know Christ, willing to sacrifice ourselves for them so that they may come to know Christ. And then the same thing, we need to have that same sacrifice for each other because in John 15, 13, Jesus said, Love one another like this. No greater love has any man than this that he lay down his life for his friends. See, I call my church family, not only my brothers and sisters in Christ, but also my friends. You're my friends. You want to be friends? <laughs> We're friends. We already are. And then, number two, their boasting is eliminated. You're, you're not going to get any better as a Christian unless you become more and more humble. And the way you'll become more and more humble as a Christian is by acknowledging the fact that God has provided all of this. It's all because of His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness, His wooing you, His calling you to Himself. I was not, as I shared before, looking for God. He surprised the you-know-what out of me. And I'm so thankful for that. He saved me from my sins. No longer am I a child of the devil. No longer am I hell-bound. I now have my identity in Christ because of what God did in my life. 
And the more and more I walk with him, the more humble I have become in that reality. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to be powerful in my preaching. It does not mean that I'm not going to be confident in my walk. And it's not doesn't mean I'm going to, not going to be faithful in my commitment. I will become stronger and stronger as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. But the fact is, it keeps humbling me over and over again as I grow in the Lord that none of this was the result of what I did. It's all because of what He has done and is doing in my life. It seems to me that God has done a marvelous work in us. And He continues to do so. Number three, their responsibility is encouraged. Verse 21, I love that. What did Isaac do when he didn't have a baby? A little different than his dad. His dad had an illicit relationship with a, a handmaid of his wife. Isaac prayed. Isaac prayed. We have a responsibility. If we're going to be spiritual children, guess how we're going to be strong? Spiritually. He prayed and he asked God to do something. And certainly... God did. In chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, we see where Abraham messed up, but here's a good wise son who learned from his dad's mistake. And then you also have in chapter 25, verses 29 through 34, Esau was given everything. He had the birthright, he had the strength, he, he had it all. And he just rejected it all. You guys, you, you, you have it all. You've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. You experienced the power of Jesus Christ working in your life and the lives of others. You're blessed to be associated with a church family. You have it all. There is no excuse why we shouldn't be faithfully walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. We got it all. So let me encourage you. I, I was so blown away this week by those of you who were here working in vacation Bible school. I know it was not easy, especially when you get up in the years and working around all those little curtain climbers. <laughs> you guys were amazing to me. Amazing. You struggled through it, very little complaining. For the most part, you were simply rejoicing and being thankful to be used by God. That was testimony to me. And I know those of you who were working, you could have, if you could have been here, you would have been. But those who were here, um, it, was, it was a joy to be around. Just a joy to be around. So thank you. Thank you. You've demonstrated your faithfulness in fulfilling your responsibility. Uh, the saints, they equip. That's what, that's what we do. When Christians come to be a part of our fellowship, we equip them. That's why he gave some to be Paul. Personally, my Bible says, personally gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be pastors, evangelists, teachers, for the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of the ministry until we all grow up in that faith and the unity in Christ Jesus. That's why we exist as a church, to build each other up in Christ. Keep growing in our confidence and faith in him. And then, the lost, they evangelize. They evangelize. In 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, how are people saved? It's not by potluck meals. It's not by doing nice things to them. It's not by singing. It's not by any other thing other than the proclamation of the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Paul said, I will preach Christ and Christ crucified. And Paul said, I have no choice in Romans chapter 1 but to preach the gospel. So those of us who are part of the family of God, who've given our lives to Him, we are expected to love each other. We have no boasting about ourselves. We are responsible. We're, we're encouraged to be responsible in who we are as servants of the Lord. And we are here to equip one another and we are here to evangelize those who are not yet part of the family of God. Let me ask you, are you a part of the family of God? Are you a part? Do you know for sure that if today were your last day on earth, that God would welcome you into heaven based solely on the fact that you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? You've understood your sin? 
you've understood that your sin deserves God's just punishment, but you also realize that he has done something gracious for you by taking the penalty of that sin and applying it to his son. And his son took that (laughs) penalty and went to the cross to die for you. Do you understand that he's done that for you? Have you then repented of your sin, turned from it, trusting Jesus Christ alone, confessing him as your Lord and your Savior? Have you done that? If you've done that, number one, I am so excited for you. That is the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. Number two, I want to encourage you to follow in obedience. Follow through in a baptism. Follow through in reading your Bible each and every day. Get involved in a church family where you're going to be discipled. We're going to equip you to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And share your faith regularly. If we don't, we become nothing but a dead sea. God wants us as a raging river that his blessings will flow through our lives into the lives of others. Can't stop here. He does not want us as a stagnant palm. He want, pond. He wants us flowing as a brisk river. So let me encourage you, build up others. Help them grow in their relationship with the Lord.